this uh, this presentation recorded and I'll release it if it's all good. It doesn't slow down the the uh, connection at all. Um, you also there's some handouts in the you should see in your little window that there's some handouts you can download some PDFs of our of the applications I have and uh, made and um, also the PowerPoint will be included as well. All right. So, like I said, we're going to be talking about the vector fine element method. So, very briefly, I'm going to go over uh, what it is in a nutshell. So, what happens is you have your simulation domain, which is basically a refractive index um, plot. So, that's the figure on the right there, with the red being a silicon uh, material with a high refractive index, and it's on a substrate of possibly silica, and it's surrounded by air. So, this is kind of representing a uh, silicon on insulator rib waveguide. Okay, <laughs> I was just uh, told that I could wasn't sharing my screen, but um, all right. Hopefully now it will be showing. If I can just make it work. All right. All right. I got the screen going now. Sorry about that. So on the right again, on the figure, we have the the silicon on insulator ridge waveguide with uh, some slanted walls, and you can see that the uh, sampling of the refractive index from the FD, the rectangular grid, gives kind of a staircase. Um, let me see if I can draw on this here. Right here, this the staircase effect that leads to some uh, errors. I'll, I'll go into more of that detail in a, in a little bit. <clears throat> so what you do in the find out method is you take the domain, you discretize it into a bunch of little triangles, as you should see now appearing on your screen. Um, so it takes the exact geometry of the problem and discretizes it into little triangles, which also are called elements. And then over each element, the electric field is approximated by a set of basis functions. And I'll show you one a picture of one of them. So depending on your the element you use, here we're using vector elements. The vector field is approximated by, if it's a first order, three uh, vector basis functions. And this is the first basis function that's associated with edge one. So you can see that it, it has a constant tangential uh, part to the edge, and it goes to zero at the opposite corner. <clears throat> and then you formulate the problem by including all these elements into a matrix equation where you want to minimize the error of uh, these functions approximating the field according to some functional. And there's a lot more math that goes along with that, but uh, if you're interested in that, then you can uh, look at some of the technical background that I have on the, on the mode solver. I just wanted to talk about that so that I can explain how you can improve the accuracy using a fine element solution or method. And that is one simple way is just to use more elements. We use smaller elements and a lot more of them where the field is changing faster. So, so your, your uh, little elements can do a better job at approximating the electric field. <clears throat> or the other way you can do it is by using higher order elements. So these are elements that are not linear, like the ones I showed you. They are maybe quadratic or cubic, and there's more basis functions, so you get a much better um, approximation of the field over a single element. So those are the two major ways of increasing a accuracy. <clears throat> and here's an example of a quadratic basis function on the right there just to show you. So it's um, it's got one zero along the edge and the whole base function uh, goes to zero at the opposite corner. Just to show you a picture of that so maybe it makes some sense. So this is again, this is a quadratic element, and I'm going to show you uh, cubic elements in the simulations. All right, so the, the first thing I did with the fine element mode solver was compare it to a optical fiber uh, mode solution. And these modes are useful for benchmarks because they have analytical solutions. And uh, we have a fiber vector solver in our, in our software, so I could easily compare it to the vector solver, the fiber vector solver. We also have a finite difference uh, solver and a ADI. So I did a quick comparison between them and the one I'm using. 
<clears throat> and I, I found some interesting things. For one, the vector fine element mode solver is a lot more accurate. And it's simply because the, uh, the number of points around the circle you can, you can set with the, with the settings of the fine element solver. And you can really get a really um, accurate approximation of the circular geometry. Whereas the FD and ADI using a rectangular sample grid, again, leads to that staircase effect. And I'll show it to you uh, in the software in a second. So on the right, I have the fiber. It's sort of a high contrast fiber. So you're not looking for the linearly polarized modes, the LP type modes. We're looking for the vector modes. So these are the, the nomenclatures HE, uh, one one is the fundamental, and then you have TE and a TM mode and another HE two one. So these are truly the vector modes of the of the fiber. And I'll show you the results first before I look at the example. What I did was I found the first six modes of this fiber, and then I averaged the error and I took the exact solution to be the fiber vector solver. And then I for the six first modes, I found the average error and then compared that between the different solvers. So in the first column, we have the exact or the, the fiber vector solver. And then we have the ADI in the next column, the finite difference method, and the finite element using first order basis functions, and then the finite element using third order basis functions. And then I pegged the, the time it took to simulate on the same machine roughly to the same order. So the, the vector fine element method took about 65 seconds or about a minute. And then I wanted to compare mostly the fine element to the FD, so I, I pegged it to the FD, which took 109 seconds. So they're about on the same order of simulation time, about a minute, <clears throat> um, but they're not exactly the same. But if you look at the uh, average error in the bottom uh, row, you'll see that if you use the exact solution as a fiber vector, the um, FD gets about just about 0.1% error average over the six modes for the effective modal index. The fine element using first order is about 0.01%, so about 10 times more accurate. And then the third order base functions is about um, 10,000 uh, times more accurate than the finite difference method. And again, I, I, uh, from my studies, I found that this is really due to the fact that you can approximate the circular uh, geometry geometry a lot more accurately with the fine element mesh than the FD mesh. The ADI method is uh, understood to be a little less accurate for high contrast waveguides uh, where the modes are vectorial in nature. So it's to be, under, to be expected that it has the worst, um, it's the worst uh, um, accurateness, accurate. Accuracy, that's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> and um, yeah, so kind of going into this, I knew the ADI was going to be a little bit less accurate, although it is pretty fast uh, to find modes. All right, now I'm going to switch over to the, to the software here just to show you what I did. Um, so this is the, our OptiMode software that comes with BPM. <clears throat> So again, here we have the, the project, just has a simple circular profile in the middle. I um, believe it's about one micron in radius. I'll just zoom in here, and I'll show you the, uh, the F EM mesh after I look at the FD. So this is the FD mesh that was used. You can see the staircase effect of the, of the rectangular sampling of the, of the circle. And now I'm going to superimpose the uh, fine element mesh over top and you can see that it actually captures the uh, circular nature of it quite well. Right here, you can see that it, it's almost a, a perfect circle. And I found this to be the limiting factor of the accuracy of the, at least the fine element mesh. If I put more points around the circle, it became a lot more uh, accurate. <clears throat> and this is set in the, uh, in the FEM solver parameters. If you change this minimum edge length, Say if we go up to, to a much larger edge length, this uh, circle is going to be um, a lot more roughly approximated. So still pretty good now. But uh, again, like I said, when I did the simulations, I found that, that uh, making this a lot more accurate 
improve the accuracy of the final modes. So if, if we go through that uh, simulation, the results we get are like this. So if you look at the pointing vector down here, the tab is PZ, so it's the pointing vector in the Z direction. We get the fundamental mode, uh, obviously has like a Gaussian in nature, it's a peak. And we see if up here we have the six modes, and the first two are the same mode, but one is more uh, X polarized, and the other one is more Y polarized. So the pointing vector is very similar, it's just the uh, polarization is different. Then to the higher order modes, we have the, a TM mode here, it's got the circular um, profile, the pointing vector. This is the TE mode, and here's the higher order EH, or sorry, the HE modes. They have the, uh, the square <coughs> appearance. And I'll just show you again the, the TM mode here. So if we go to the magnetic field in the Z direction, this will be very small. Um, or maybe this is the TE mode. Sorry, it's a TE mode. <laughs> So it's transverse electric, so the, the electric field along the Z or propagation direction is very small. If you look on the right, it's about a million times smaller than the, the EY field, which is one. And this is, the reason there is a little field here is just because of numeric error. You can't really get away from it unless you use a finer mesh. All right, so that was just to show the accuracy of the, of the mode solver in comparison to the vector final, uh, fiber solver. But uh, again, you can apply this solver to any type of geometry you can describe in our designer. So there's more interesting problems to solve. One very important and interesting one, um, in research at least, is the, uh, is the modes of a, like a gold strip. So these are the modes that are surface plasmon polaritons. And a particular subset of them are called long-ranging surface plasmon polaritons. And they have the characteristic that they are less lossy than the, the short-range uh, surface plasma and platons. And they exist for even very thin films. So here we have, on the right here, a, a silver core, which is about one micron, it's a, well, it's exactly one micron wide, and the thickness is 20 nanometers. And I'm taking this example from a paper by Pierre Barini from the University of Ottawa. Down here in the, the bottom we have the reference um, where he explored these modes using a method of lines approach. And this is a good example for the fine element solver because of its high aspect ratio. It's much wider than it is thick, and this makes it difficult for a finite difference approach to capture its geometry um, accurately. Because not only that it is wide and it's thin, but also the fact that the electric field is not so tightly confined to the to the core. It's actually it actually spreads pretty far out to the boundaries. So there's a kind of a disconnect between the geometry and the, uh, the optical field. And so you need to be able to mesh the geometry as well as uh, display the field. All right. <clears throat> so I did the simulation with the fine element solver, and I compared it to the plot that, that is in the Pierre Brini uh, paper. And we get the same uh, dispersion for the silver thickness. So as you can see down in the bottom left, when the thickness gets shorter and shorter, uh, some modes experience a cutoff, namely the, um, the asymmetric uh, symmetric modes of the orange and the higher order symmetric symmetric uh, blue, blue line, dotted line. And this SS0 mode, which is the thick blue line, is that's the long ranging surface plasmon player time. So as the thickness gets lower, the loss of it also drops. So it's got interest for um, if you want to make design a waveguide that has low loss but also pretty highly confined to a silver silver core. And I'll show you the setup in in our software in OptiMode. It's in the uh, green here. I just want to again highlight why the fine element does a better job at simulating this. If you go to the refractive index tab again, you'll see that it doesn't even see the core. Using this grid size, it doesn't even get a sample inside the, the silver core, so you wouldn't be simulating, simulating anything really. Of course, if you, if you change this to a higher mesh, say 200, you will get uh, 
the mesh will finally it'll get one at least maybe one mesh cell in the, uh, the core region. And now if I just make sure that I have the right fine element settings, <clears throat> if I do the fine element mesh, it gets a much more accurate picture of the of the thin core layer. So if you see here the it's constrained to the to the rectangular um, edge. You also notice that the the mesh is only in this top right quadrant um, because I'm using symmetric boundary conditions. Since it's symmetric along uh, about the y-axis and also about the x-axis, I can reduce the simulation domain and only have to simulate a quarter of the of the uh, structure. <clears throat> so that's why I only have a quarter of the mesh. And then playing with the boundary conditions up here and down on the minimum x, you can get the the three the sorry the four different combinations to get the proper modes you want. <clears throat> so if you run this, uh, you get a picture that comes out like this. So these modes are all TM in nature. They have a major EY component um, because the EX component uh, experiences a lot of loss at the interface um, between the metal and the, and the dielectric. If you want a high plot, you can see it even more clearly. So you see the field actually is pretty large compared to the, the thin metal metal core, silver core. Um, but if you don't accurately uh, mesh that core, you're not going to get the right mode for this exact uh, geometry. So this is another you know, example of the power of the fine element approach is that you can really get these the geometry, you can also get the field accurately approximated. And this is the pointing vector, which is very similar to the one uh, in, the, in Pierre Brini's paper. <clears throat> the other thing I want to show here is that um, if you look at uh, the theory behind uh, electric fields, you can kind of get the, get the idea that the field changes more rapidly or the, you could say the effective wavelength is shorter in a higher index material, which means the field can vary more rapidly. <clears throat> so I have, we have an, a, a method to adapt the mesh to this problem. If we use uniform material dependent mesh, you'll get a, a better resolution of mesh in a higher index material. And it'll just, maybe if I just show you, it'll be more clear. <clears throat> So here if we do a material dependent mesh, you get a lot smaller triangles in this core region where the field is uh, rapidly um, changing. And outside, it still uses the, um, still uses the more larger elements so that the simulation doesn't take uh, forever to finish. It's also a very important um, method to use when meshing uh, a, a problem like this where you have a really high uh, contrast. <clears throat> All right, and then moving along, that was uh, the method applied to the um, plasma and platons, and you can use this again to find the modes. The other modes here, right there, I was just showing the SS0 mode because it's the most uh, probably interesting because um, you can end fire couple it to maybe fiber modes or other integrated photonic modes, but there's these other uh, asymmetric modes that have higher loss um, but maybe have some interesting properties that you could research. <clears throat> All right, so moving on, to the other application that I applied the mode solver to was the, um, the problem of hollow core fibers. And these are particularly interesting because they have a lower, con lower index in the center, so in the right side here we have blue representing air or refractive index of one. And the outside cladding is a silica matrix. So this is silica, which has a refractive index of about 1.44. And the way this structure guides, way, uh, guides light is that it introduces a band gap into the photonic crystal structure. So you're kind of forcing fields not to propagate in, the, in this complicated uh, crystal structure and they're only allowed to propagate through the center core area. Um, these, these modes are always leaky, so we have to use absorbing boundary conditions. Since you can never make an infinitely wide or infinitely uh, wide uh, periodic structure, at one point you're not gonna, it's not going to be perfectly periodic and you're going to have leaky fields. 
The other interesting thing is that the modal index, the effective index is less than one, so it has a less modal index than air, um, than a plane wave in air. It's important to know that it doesn't actually mean that it's traveling faster than the speed of light, because the speed of light in the sub in the wave in the mode is um, <clears throat> contributed to the group index, um, which is kind of a derivative of the modal index, and of course that is greater than one, just over one. But I wanted to show that uh, using the initial estimate of the mode modal index, you can find these modes, and you can do really complex structures with the fine element mode solver. And again, in this in this problem, I I uh, exploited the symmetry of the waveguide, and I only did the upper right quadrant. <clears throat> and here we have an example of the mesh uh, for this for this uh, um, waveguide. So in the software, if I go to there, we can look at the mesh. I don't know which one was which now. This one, I'll just exit the other ones so I don't get confused. <clears throat> and again, if I mesh it, you see that I have a lot of points along these circles from my application, the first one, benchmark compared to the optical fiber, I realize that it really, it's really important to get an accurate approximation of these uh, circular holes. And if you run the simulation, you get <clears throat> the fundamental sort of mode of the hollow core fiber. And in this case, I chose the boundary conditions to give it a major EY component. So here we have the amplitude of the electrophile in the y direction, and everything is scaled to one. So here we have a major part of the field is in the center, which is very similar to the fundamental mode of an optical, of a, of a more, um, the more obvious optical fiber with a high index core. And the pointing vector, again, is it's in the middle. So the, flow, the power flow is in the middle, and it's confined in this crystal structure. It's also very interesting if you look at the phase of the of the major component. So here, if we look at the, the phase of the EY, you can see the leaky the leaky um, structure and leaky mode behavior, where you have the phase is changing, and say in the x direction, it's got a negative slope. And in our kind of convention, when you have a phase that's changing linearly, that means there's uh, there's a kind of a, a wave traveling in that direction. And if you increase the domain size, I didn't do it for this one, but if you increase the domain size, you see that this, these, uh, these peaks, they kind of start to match up. So you really get a sort of a plane wave um, traveling outwards. And I want to show uh, the adaptive mesh that I, that I applied to this as well. That's actually this result that I showed. <clears throat> so. I know that the center mode is going to be sort of like a fundamental mode of a fiber, which has a field that's sort of Gaussian. It's a pretty good. A Gaussian is a pretty good approximation of a fundamental mode of a of a fiber. So here I just generate one using our tools. So I just generate a distribution like this, and then using this F three D file, you can generate a mesh if I find the right designer. Again, this is another option in the Advanced Mesh Settings tab. If you go to Type of Mesh and you choose this, this file that I generated, you can get a mesh that's uh, more accurate in the center of the core. So in here, it's, it's more adapted to the fundamental mode than the one that I, that I had before. If I switch between them, maybe it's more clear. I'll reset them so they're the same. Sorry. All right, so we have a lot more mesh points in the center of the waveguide for the adapted mesh than we do for the, the one that's just kind of a uniform mesh. Uh, I didn't really explain this. Uh, I did it briefly, but we did a absorbing boundary simulation. So that's what this added part is on the, on the outside of the domain. We have about a one micron uh, layer here. And in this layer, the material is taking on the properties of an absorbing uh, a boundary. So the waves that are, any leaky waves that are traveling out of this waveguide will be absorbed by these non-reflecting uh, UPMLs. 
all right, and if there's any questions at any time, uh, let me know. Uh, we're getting close to the end of this webinar. Um, I tried to keep it down to 30 minutes uh, <laughs> as best I could. I think I went over some things pretty quick. Um, but again, let's touch on the mesh here because it's really important to get the proper mesh to get a very accurate mode. Um, so the down, the window down here, the output window, you get some of the characteristics of the mesh. So you get the number of points, uh, the number of edges, all these little edges in here, and the number of elements. You can read that as the number of triangles, etc. And then also the degrees of freedom. So these degrees of freedom are calculated from the number of elements and the other two number of points and edges. And that basically tells you how big the final uh, matrix equation is going to be. Um, so it gives you an idea of how much memory is going to be used uh, by your computer. Here it's about 100,000 uh, dimension, and I've run simulations easily up to uh, a million. Um, they take longer, about a minute or so, but um, uh, on a personal computer, you can definitely go up to a much higher uh, matrix size. <clears throat> Other important thing for these hollow core fibers, like I said, is that their modal index is less than one. So if you go into the solver parameters for the FEM, you see here that we have an initial estimate. This initial estimate is, you're, you're basically saying to the solver, I want to find modes that are close to this modal index. Um, so here we, I put 0.99 because I knew from the paper that I was trying to reproduce, that I have in the PowerPoint there, um, the modes they found were, were around 0.993 or, or something like that. And then uh, using that as an estimate, I found those modes first. <clears throat> Otherwise, you'd find modes that are more confined to the, the silica substrate here. In the other, in the in more general uh, problems, waveguide problems, where you have just a high index core, usually the the modes are have some type of average value between the cladding and the core. So we have this toggle box here. We just say use max index, and that'll find the fundamental mode, which has the highest modal index. Um, which is will be closest to the to the um, <clears throat> to the high and in, high core index. So if you don't really know where your modes are, generally using just the use max max index is just going to be you know pretty good, pretty good way to start. So that was the whole hollow core uh, fiber example. And um, I have I have more, but I didn't want to make this webinar too long, so. Uh, I'll just briefly you know, touch on what other applications the fine element mode solver can do. Um, like I said, you can do absorbing boundary conditions, so you can do any type of leaky modes, like modes that are sitting on top of a substrate, so maybe you have some of the fields leaking into the substrate. Um, that's easy to do. Um, you can also apply this mode solver to anisotropic materials, um, so you know, lithium niobate waveguides or even silicon waveguides have a little bit of anisotropy in them. Uh, you can capture that with this mode solver. It also uses transformation optics, so you can transform a bent waveguide problem into a straight waveguide problem, find the the modes of a bent waveguide. So that's what we have on the on the picture on the right there. This is a um, again some type of silicon on silica uh, waveguide, rectangular ridge waveguide. Uh, I believe it's silicon on silica, and it's a bent mode. So you can see the the field is kind of being pushed out to the side um, from the nature of a bent waveguide. And also, if, if you go into the example, you'll find that uh, there is a leaky uh, wave that's kind of coming out of the mode of the waveguide to the right, <clears throat> which is consistent with how uh, bent waveguides uh, operate. And again, um, I showed some really simple geometries for the long-range surface plasmon platons just because I wanted to match to the paper. But uh, unlike different methods, the FEM method, uh, sorry, the FEM can adapt to uh, really complicated geometries. So you could do, you could find the um, modes of, you know, triangular waveguides, um, triangular, sorry, uh, plasma and polariton waveguides, or circular, or any type of, uh, maybe like a slot waveguide where you have two ridges close together. Any type of thing like that, you can definitely do with the FEM uh, solver. Um, so all these examples I showed uh, are actually should be upline online and uploaded to our website. They also should be in your 
in your uploaded um, handouts that's in this webinar, if you can find them, there'll be three of those in there, the Holocore, the benchmarking uh, example, and the Plasma and Polariton example, and also this PowerPoint. <coughs> and um, yeah, um, now we're into the question period. I kind of made it to the 30 minute uh, time limit I wanted to do, so if anyone has any questions, you can raise your hand or ask a question in the in the box. And um, let me know if you have any questions, yeah. <laughs> and the references, again, I'll just post them here at the end, uh, the PowerPoint. So the first one for the Plasma and Polariton was uh, um, from Pierre Brini, where he showed the modes of symmetric structures. The second one I didn't actually mention, I should have probably mentioned it better, but it was um, a paper on classifying the modes of a holocore photonic band gap fiber. And I took the pretty much the, exactly the same uh, geometry as they as they had. So you make sure to check those ones out. And um, thanks for listening, and uh, that'll be the, the end of the webinar. Again, I'll, I'll have this recording saved, and I'll upload it to the website. And we'll be at Photonics West this week, so be sure to come check our check us out at our booth. Um, yeah. Thank you.